Hi, Dr. Brian Kaufman here on the last day of ASH 2023, Chief Medical Officer, Executive Vice President at the CLL Society. Jennifer Brown, Director of the CLL Center and Institute Physician at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and the Worthington and Margaret Collette Professor of Medicine in the field of hematologic oncology at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Brown, there's been a lot of buzz in the last year and really accelerated in the last week since we got approval of pertubrutinib. And pertubrutinib works on the BTK pathway, but it works in a different way. Maybe you could just spend a, a little bit explaining what the advantages of pertubrutinib is, and then this research that you presented about how resistance develops to it. Mm -hmm. So right now we have two main classes of BTK inhibitors. We have the covalent inhibitors, and those include abrutinib, acalabrutinib, and xanabrutinib. And they all bind irreversibly to BTK at one particular site. And so when resistance develops to those, the most common mechanism of that seems to be mutation of that specific site so that the drugs no longer can bind. Pertabrutinib is the first drug in this new class, which is called non-covalent, which means reversible. But what it really means is it's not dependent on any one specific site. So it can bind even in the cases where people's disease has acquired that earlier mutation. Or if that mutation isn't there, even in the setting of other cases of resistance. So it, it's having quite exciting activity in that setting. So somebody who had failed a calibrutinib, xanabrutinib, vibrutinib, might gain benefit or often does gain benefit and that's what the Bruin study and other studies have shown. This is incredible and you and I have talked in the past about there may be advantages if you're working well blocking the BTK pathway and okay this way doesn't block it anymore now I've got a new way to block it. Right exactly so you can stay in class as we call it and you don't have to go to a different category of drug and in fact the Bruin study pertubrutinib works so well that the FDA has approved it just based on this single arm trial. Right it's an accelerated approval still has to get the confirmatory phase three trial but this is they're saying hey here's an unmet need for patients who progress after a couple drugs um, and we recognize that and here's a drug that works in that setting. So we've talked about how efficacious it is, but CLL is smart and they find a way around this. So you, to your credit, and your team have been looking at does, how does resistance develop to PERTO because resistance develops to everything in CLL, doesn't it? Mm, yeah. Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. Right, so what we found, we have 88 patients from the Bruin trial who, whose diseases progressed on the pertubrutinib and where we have paired samples from prior to treatment and at progression. And so we found that the main way that we're seeing resistance is actually still BTK, that target, but not the 481 site. Actually, and the, the 481 site's that binding site that ibrutinib, calibrutinib, and xanabrutinib, and they sort of, they, they don't fit in there anymore. They can't block it, yeah. Right, exactly. So because of that, half the people on this trial came into the trial with that mutation. And that one actually goes away. Wow. Yeah. We're going to talk about that later because I have questions to ask about that. Yeah. Sure. Uh, but then there are two others, predominant, many others, but two other predominant ones that come up. One is called 474. It's just a different location. And then the other one's called 528W. The interesting thing about some of these mutations is they behave a little bit differently than the, the one 481 that causes the resistance to the calibrutinib and xanabrutinib. They don't necessarily activate the same pathway in the same way. So there's a lot of work going on to figure out exactly how they, what they do is they kind of bypass the beginning and then still seem to activate downstream. And that may still be dependent on BTK, but that's not completely clear. So we're working on that in the lab. That, that's very interesting. So these mutations develop and then the PERTO stops working. Now I've got to ask you, if it gets rid of the C481 mutation, doesn't this make you want to say, well, could I use Acala or Xanu or, or Ibrutinib again? Well, right, that's a very interesting question about which we have no data. I have to say, I, I just started doing that with my first patient <laughs> based okay. on the mutation profile. So I, it, it looks actually somewhat promising, but, but we have to pick specifically because, for example, the calibrutinib, at least in a test tube, has some activity against the 528 mutation, but not the 474.
Okay. Whereas, and Ibrutinib has activity against 474, for example. So it might, we might eventually get to a situation where we look at the mutation profile and can choose the best drug to go back to based on that. But that, that's still very pie in the sky at the moment. We don't have any actual data on that. Well, this is really exciting uh, uh, research. I mean, this is important, and this is why I think people have to understand about this clonal evolution. It's not just a question of which drug, but understanding and, you know, which one is going to work for your particular. This is really individualized medicine to get there. A any final thoughts on this whole area of how these resistance develops and what the implications down the line will be future areas of research? Right, well, so we're looking ahead to even another category of method of inhibiting BTK, one where we destroy the BTK entirely, the BTK degraders. Right. And uh, Beijing had a poster on their degrader drug here, which actually looked fairly encouraging in terms of the activity. So that's something to keep an eye out for. All right, and I think there's a couple other companies. Nurex has Nurex uh, also. had, had uh, yeah. presentations on that, and I think there's Acutar is coming up, and I think there's other companies. Abby and also on. has one. Right. right, yeah, so these are all in development. We're getting early data. Let me ask you about one other thing. Downstream from BTK is PCL gamma 2, mm. which is a gain of function. It turns back on that whole pathway. Do we have any sense of the activity? That's another method, less common method of resistance to the, the sort of the first three covalent uh, BTK inhibitors. Do we know if PERTO works against that, or do we have any data on that? You know, the data are very limited because there are very few patients where we have only an isolated PLC gamma 2, so it, it, it's really hard to study. That is the one situation which when you look across all the possible predictors of response with pertubrutinib where it looks like maybe it's a little bit lower, yeah. but there's only about 17 patients, so right. it's really hard to know. We actually, we're doing studies in the lab looking at, at serial sample clonal evolution, and we do have one patient who has a PLC gamma 2 mutation that seems to stay stable or actually decline during PERDO. It, it's the only one that we have, though, so it's really kind of hard to say. I think what we may need to do is model the specific mutations, because PLC gamma 2 mutations, there are a variety of them, and they're in different spots in the protein. Right. And it may be that we actually need to generate these in the lab and try to study them with the different drugs. Dr. Brown, I'm so grateful for the uh, research you and your colleagues are doing. It's so important. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks.